But yeah, it, it was amazing to me how much more interesting it was because the stakes were so high. The game pace wasn't increased at all. In fact, there's there's a 15 minute rain delay in the middle of it. But because the stakes of the game were so high, like the delays in between didn't seem nearly as bad as just watching an average, you know, early June baseball game. Yeah, it was definitely even with the downtime. It was like, ah, oh, what's gonna happen? <laughs> that was really cool. Um, you know what's gonna happen right now? Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 101 for Thursday, the 10th of November, 2016. This is a show where two lifelong friends talk about geek stuff and whatever else comes to mind. I'm Amos, that's Kent. We have not Patrick with us today, Patrick Bejaw. And Kent, you would not understand how much I dreaded over what to call the episode number. Was it 101, 101, 101? What was <laughs> it going to be? It confused me. This is the first episode fully out of beta. Wow. Like I stress over the stupidest things. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It's it's notable because there wasn't the word beta in front of the number. Yeah. And, and beta, beta is enough like, like beja. And Patrick, you're with us tonight. <laughs> um, man, it's so awesome to have you on the show. Like you're one of the one of the podcasters that I've admired without actually hearing your podcast, but just your contributions to other podcasts. And it's just been amazing. And finally, I don't even know what it was with a uh, couple of a couple months ago, I finally turned on to the Phillies Club, and I was like, oh, my God, this is the podcast I've been waiting for for so long. This is so amazing. We're so happy to have you oh, on. Oh, wow. Here. Thank you. I th I thought you were going to say, like, you know, I've admired you for so long, uh, only through your contributions to other shows, and I was going to go like, well, you're in for a disappointment <laughs> when you act listen to the actual <laughs> things I do. <laughs> but you, you, you know it, and you still like it, so thank you. I'm very reassured. Um, so the Phillies Club, uh, Pixels, the Rendezvous Tech, and what else do you got going on? I know you got other things going on on the on the French spin. I'm, I know I'm I'm giving all this stuff early. Like, why am I pimping your stuff early? But whatever. It's it's ah, uh, it's yeah. Th there's a bunch of stuff. You know what? We can talk about it at the end of the show if people are interested after they've heard me uh, ramble on for a little while. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll keep that for the end. <laughs> hey Kent, man, how was your week this week, dude? Um, emotionally draining. Uh, <laughs> for what? <laughs> Uh, as, as for all Americans, I think. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's really about all I can say. Um, yeah. So last, last week, last Friday, uh, my family and I, I, I know you're talking about the Cubs game, right? That's, that's <laughs> what the, right. That, that, yes, that was very emotionally draining. And luckily that, that ended up in a win for my team. Um, uh, <laughs> The, the Cubs, a lifelong Cubs fan here. So that was amazing. Unlike uh, un unlike other recent contests, but anyway. Right. But then my family and I went to see Doctor Strange on Friday. Oh, okay. So that was a, a super good time. Now, did you uh, see it in standard in 3D and IMAX 3D? Like, give me the scoop here. Because I've heard this is one of the few movies that the, the deeper you go into it, the more you get out of it. Right. Unfortunately, I don't have an IMAX screen near me, except for the one at the. We have a space museum up on the uh, the hill. I'm guessing and they didn't show they, it. They they only show documentaries. They don't show Hollywood movies. All right. It's it's a so traditional IMAX. Right. So unfortunately, I I didn't have that experience, but I did watch it in 3D, and the visuals for that movie are simply astounding. And I even if you're not a like a hardcore 3D guy or whatever, I definitely recommend seeing this. Um, you know, I've I've seen the movie as well. Uh, last week, I think it came out in um, in uh, Europe a little bit earlier than in the U.S. And the the good news is that with the I don't know if you're aware there was a, a an election um, this week in the U.S. And the main the super important part of it. I mean, there were different questions being asked to U.S. citizens, but in many states, uh, it was asked of them whether or not to legalize uh, medicinal and recreational marijuana. And Doctor Strange, I believe, is the perfect thing to watch when you are on those <laughs> recreational drugs because it is so trippy. 
I mean, it's unbelievably trippy already without any kind of uh, substance to abuse. But with marijuana, I think you'll forget everything about everything else. Uh, <laughs> see, and, and that just that just goes to prove my point of why we should be legalizing it everywhere. Because I'm all about it. You want to enhance a movie, little puff puff, move on into the theater, and <laughs> bam, you know? Who needs 3D? And, I got and this uh, one especially. This one especially. I mean, I, I, you haven't seen it, Amos, right? I have not. Okay, Kent, you're, I'm sure you're on me with this. It's possibly, it's more trippy than like any other movie I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's on par with... Uh, Fear and Loving? Uh, blank now. What is, the, what is the Leonardo DiCaprio movie that came out? A few yes, uh, Inception. Inception. Uh, yes. It's on par with that like trippy visual, like, oh my God, what is happening? How did they do this kind of thing? Now, how how does it stack up against Fear and Loathing? Ooh, see, that's that's an entirely different brand of trippiness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the uh, yes, that movie was trippy, but this this is just takes it to a different level of this, just this visual craziness that's happening in front of you, and especially yeah. in three D. It's like, oh my god, because you can almost you feel like you can just touch these things that are happening on the screen. It's wow. just it, it's pretty, yeah, I, pretty good. I, I think the, the, the difference between Inception is and this, and, you know, maybe Fear and Loathing is, is more similar to an extent, but it's really just the visuals that are like a giant, uh, uh, you know, awakening kaleidoscope of, of weirdness. And... The the very strange thing is that in this movie it kind of makes sense without <laughs> making sense. It's weird. It fits perfectly in the in the movie, but if you if you took out all of the visually weird scenes from the movie, it would be you know it, it, no one would think that this could ever work in anything. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Yeah. For sure, for sure. I highly recommend it, Amos. You need to. You need to see I, I it. might, I might just grab up the kids and and take them tomorrow or or, or Saturday, just because. Um, now, Patrick, you have had an interesting week yourself. Yes, <laughs> that's all the introduction that is needed for me to start <laughs> renting for. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've been, you know, I was traveling to the U.S. for BlizzCon, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But um, after I landed, first of all, the trip, I'm currently in uh, Helsinki in Finland. And the trip from Finland is basically four hours of plane to London and then 11 hours of uh, plane time to the U.S. with some downtime in London. So overall, it was like 20 hours. It was grueling. Um, and then I landed the next day I broke one of my wisdom teeth and I figured, Hey, it's going to be okay. I'm just here for two days. It's going to be fine. Right. So I sort of went to Twitter to, to whine and at the same time to sort of make sure to get some kind of reassurance from, from Twitter that it would be okay. <laughs> and people were thankfully, um, aware that it was not going to be okay and <laughs> made it well known to me. Um, so basically they were like, dude, don't even, don't joke with this. This is, you're going to be in so much pain in, in five hours if you don't get it fixed. So uh, I was staying with our uh, friend Tom Merritt and uh, his dentist was, in, was on vacation. So we went to Yelp and looked for a good dentist <laughs> for, on Yelp. <laughs> of all places. Um, we found one, we went there and she, you know, I thought she was going to clean the, the tooth, put a little bit of filling, hold me over until I'm back in a country where I do have excellent, you know, free healthcare. And, uh, and she looked at it and she was like, Ooh, <laughs> it's like, what? Ooh, what? Ooh. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. And, uh, and so she was, she was telling me she could either do a root canal, which cause it was going to be like 1300 bucks, or she had to take it out, which was going to be 800 bucks. Um, needless to say, I had not planned on spending <laughs> that much money. And, um, 
And so I was asking her, isn't there an option where I, I leave here and pretend like it didn't happen? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she was telling me that I could, but that I would probably be in an emergency room in like 12 hours. So took it out, went to BlizzCon with a missing wisdom tooth. And I'm sure that if any one of you has ever gotten one taken out. Um, oh, so she made me a prescription for some regular, you know, uh, ibuprofen and of course antibiotics, but ibuprofen and then some codeine in case I was in a lot of pain. Um, the pharmacy did not have the codeine. <laughs> and I was, I figured, you know, uh, this is a not safe for work show, right? I yes. can swear. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So I figured, fuck this. I'm just going to go to BlizzCon, just get the ibuprofen. It's going to be enough. Uh, and and for, go, and for went <laughs> the, the codeine. Um, it was okay, but it was an interesting experience having a, a dentist visit in the U.S. And especially, you know, it's not like she wasn't good. Uh, she was a very kind uh, Egyptian lady who had worked in the UK and the U S and had been in the U S for a long time. And my mom w grew up in Egypt. So we had like something in common that got me a hundred bucks rebate on the thing, which was nice. Um, but she was like, it wasn't like the pristine dental clinic that you imagine or that even, you know, usually you see in Finland or, or in France. It was like this office that was turned into a dentist's office. And <laughs> she was like dropping bloody gas on the floor a couple of times. And the, the secretary was also her assistant. And like, she did a good job. I went to the to the dental clinic here to for you know to make sure and they were like yeah it's okay it's not like she she did a bad job but it didn't inspire huge <laughs> confidence it wasn't like the this butcher shop that i would have run away from but it wasn't it was weird it's, so it sounds like the kind of place that uh, uh mel gibson would would run into to get some bullets taken out in the middle of a movie or something like that like, yes basically <laughs> not, not quite that far but but yeah if if mel gibson in the middle of an action movie had to get uh, a tooth taken out maybe that would be the place <laughs> uh hey uh welcome to obamacare so <laughs> that's what i was saying that's what i was saying for the whole thing i was like thanks obama i have free health care in my country why did he have to make it my tooth like fall out in the in the middle of my three days trip in the u.s i'm sure it was his fault Oh, man, of course. Everything I mean, is, right? I mean, why not, right? Oh, man. So <laughs> my week was nowhere near that tragic. I was essentially just on a beta hangover. I'll be honest. There was so much buildup to last week's show, and it was like we, it was 10 weeks worth of buildup to the show. The show went off w uh, uh, perfectly. Couldn't have ha had better guests on um, until this week. And uh, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was just it was just great. And then after that, like after we got done recording... I had the next day off and I didn't bother editing anything. Like I had no, no desire to even get on the computer and it took me a day and a half to get it published. And then after that, like doing the show notes this week, it, it was, it was rough getting in there and creating the show notes. And then Kent had, was feeling the same way with everything going on. And then every time I went to work this week, it was another like emotional wrapped up day. I was, I was playing, you know, uh, uh, a uh, middle party for this, or I was discussing this or giving feedback on this. And it was like this constant, I have not had a chance to fully rejuvenate until tonight. And my wife and I went to like this little mini miniature marriage seminar that we like to go to, to, you know, just to make sure we're on the same page and stuff and get a, you know, make, we, we spend a little time specifically on a marriage just to make sure that the marriage stays strong. And that really, like, I mean, like, like time with your wife should, right? It really sent a lot of, I just, man, I feel great. I'm ready to go. I'm tired because it's, it's later than typical, but man, I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed. Like I'm ready to rock and roll this weekend and just get things done. It was great. Nice. That's, you know, and that's something that I think is important when you have a relationship, you, you really should work on it. Like, uh, you know, we go to the gym to work out our, our bodies. You know, we, uh, you know, some people go to church to work out their spiritual life or, or whatever, but not a lot of people do that uh, workout, like relationship workout. Right. And uh, that's what this sounds like. And that's, I think that's a very healthy thing to do. This was a, 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 a love and money uh, a little miniature seminar, which 
uh, money was one of the key factors on both of our first marriages not succeeding. So uh. it's it's definitely a touchy subject. Now, Patrick, do you guys, do you? I mean, there in in Europe, do you guys have like little miniature seminars and little uh, little things to help? I mean, here in America, the divorce rate is just outstanding. So I don't know, I don't even know what it is on the other side of the pond. But um, do I'm sure like it's about the there? same. You know, it's um, it's not. I I don't think it would be significantly different. It happens a lot, of course. Um, I I don't know that we have seminars, but we certainly have. Uh, you know, there there is still a a stigma on um, on shrinks. I think everywhere, uh, but usually people would go talk to someone one on one. I don't think it would be seminars. The um, the idea that you go to a seminar for anything like sales or <laughs> apparently marriage or you know things like that um, seems a little bit American to me. I don't know if it's because I've seen it only in in American movies, um, but it seems so. Uh, but it's certainly not, we're, you know, we're not immune to the idea of working on working on some things, including your marriage. Um, yeah, that's uh, th- that's what comes to my mind. I, you know, the the but there are still people as well who would think, ah, you know, shrinks are for crazy people. I'm not crazy. But um, S- speaking of shrinks, have you seen the movie Shrink? Uh no. Oh, that is an amazing movie. Um Kevin Kevin Spacey is a psychologist that basically goes off the deep end. Like his problems mixed with his patients problems kind of just collide into this colossal shit show and at one point he's out back smoking a joint with one of his patients and <laughs> like and it's Kevin Spacey at his best, you know, it's this pure, pure drama and and a little bit of comedy and man, it's it's so good. Anyway, so I completely derailed that one, but I, he, he said shrink and it just popped in my mind to like that's got to be shared. So definitely recommend that one if you like Kevin Spacey. Sure. <laughs> um, so my geeky thing of the the week this week. I know Kent, you already talked about Doctor Strange and that's kind of kind of tapped you out right there. But um, <laughs> throughout this week. I played tech support so many times. Like even tonight at the little marriage thing, um, I helped them set up their sound because they couldn't get the the sound working. And it was hey, one of those things. So, sorry, sorry to get back on this, but I, I sort of uh, I, I is it okay if I ask what happens in those seminars? Oh, sort of course. Of ended the conversation there, and I, I wanted to. I'm curious because I've never heard about this. Like, what do you actually do there? So in, in this particular one, uh, there were my wife and I and maybe maybe eight, nine other couples. And we actually met on the upstairs level of a, of a bar uh, not far from where we live. And the chaplain on base was holding it, and uh, as they're usually involved with most marriage things that uh, the Air Force provides. And this was multi-service. Anybody related to the military, even if you were a civilian, just working on base, whatever, you could go. And what they did was they gave a, a questionnaire to you and your spouse and asks, asked you to fill out certain things. And then you kind of compared your answer to, on how you view your finances and where you think you should be going with your finances and kind of how close are you on, on your ideals. And uh, it, it basically, it, for the hour and a half, it essentially was a conversation starter and a way to if you're not seeing eye to eye on your finances and you and you don't think th- that you're kind of jiving with it, to either confirm that you are jiving or that you're not, and give it give you a conversation starter on how to how to straighten things out and, and kind of reach a common goal and and mediate in between. My wife and I, what we got out of it, we had we didn't realize just how close our desires and ideas for our finances were. We thought we were way apart. And come to find out that the only thing that we disagreed on was credit card usage. And it was mostly a definition. You know, she put on, I want no balances. And I was like, I don't want no balances, but I don't want to really use them. And come to find out that it was basically, we were saying the same thing. We just had different, we we defined the circles differently when we marked them off. So um, mm-hmm. essentially, it's, it's a conversation starter, something to keep keep the conversation going because a lot of people like to shut down when it comes to finances. You know, it's one of those big things that really interrupts marriages a lot. And it was a way just to, to get that conversation going. 
So is that something you go to when there are there's already trouble or do you just go there so there isn't trouble in the future? My wife and I went, we, well, anytime there's these seminars that we can find and they're open and, and free, we'll go because we, we enjoy exploring our, our uh, like I said, we're on our second marriage each. You know, this is ours, not to mm. each other, but, you know, we were both previously married. <clears throat> and anytime we can go to these things, just to make sure we're, you know, it's like a tune up on a car. You, you know, there's might not be anything wrong with it, but you just want to go and, and check the oil and, and make sure that it's running the right direction. And that's kind of how we use these things. We use them every chance that we get. And there are couples that have deep problems, but sometimes they don't even know it until they go to one of these things and realize, hey, we're not we're not together anywhere on this financial thing or on the spiritual thing or on how to raise a family. And there's different little little subjects for each one, but that's essentially what it is. Yeah, I think right. I think most couples that go to these things have have identified the problem and realize that all right, we need to do something. Uh, neither one of us want the marriage to end so let's take some steps and that's usually where these things come. yep makes sense yeah it, either way it was pretty interesting so um now the, the other th the other geeky thing going back to unless you had another another question about it patrick like by all means no i mean i could talk about it for a long time i'm sure but let's move on <laughs> um Kent, you watched the CNN, the 60s series a long time ago. I saw several episodes and had to go back and start finishing the 60s so I could move on to the 70s, which is, of course, when I was born. So I'm very interested in what happened in that decade. And the one that I watched was the episode on civil rights and the civil rights movement. Um, now, Patrick, I don't know if you have access to this on Netflix or whatever, but have you seen these, these documentaries on, uh, from CNN on the 60s? Which ones are they? Uh, CNN uh, has developed, has made these these document like hour hour and a half documentaries on each decade, the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, and they they go through and they ta talk about one specific subject per episode. And there's usually like eight or ten episodes for each decade. Okay, no, I I haven't seen them, but it sounds super interesting. Uh, they, yeah, these are these are incredibly well done documentaries. I mean, you can say what you want about CNN as a news organization, but they put together some absolutely incredible uh, footage and um, a narration for these things. They're 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 spectacular. I cannot say enough good things about these documentaries. It, it makes me wish that you know, especially with Patrick on, it makes me wish that there were, that we in the U.S. had access. Maybe we do. Maybe I just don't know because I'm a I'm a stupid American. But that we had <laughs> access to documentaries like this about other places in the world. Like we're all about ourselves here in America, you know. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm multicultural curious. You know, I like to learn about everybody, not just us. Um, but even even hey, just, just listen to the Phileas Club. I, You'll have everything you need. Oh, I, I so do. I so do. <laughs> <laughs> And it, I'll just pepper it, you know, <laughs> random shameless plugs in the in the show. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was another thing. And then uh, Perseverance, the beer I had last weekend is having a, um, or last week on the podcast, uh, is having a 30th, 30th birthday party tomorrow night at that same bar we went to tonight. So I'm going back because I want to get my mug, my poster, and more beer. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I, I love when breweries put on events like that because that's there, there's just something about the craft beer culture that I I really enjoy and when whenever they put on an event brings people together and they're celebrating the you know the beer and it's just I don't know th those things are always a good time to me. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, do you drink beer? I actually don't drink that much. Um, yeah. It's not for any kind of you know religious reason or anything. It's just I don't enjoy drinking all that much which is i think making me miss a lot of joy in life <laughs> but um yeah i never really got into it so when i hear people talk about you know the wonderful beers and wines that they enjoy it makes me a little bit jealous mm. yeah it's, I, it's not for everybody uh, and i've i've gone through periods of my life where i have abstained from drinking and uh, yeah i mean it's one of those things it's not necessary but when you're when you when it is something that you enjoy, it can be, can be really a, a wonderful experience as long as you're not overindulging or doing, you know, getting into trouble when you when you drink. 
<laughs> and that's, you know, that fortunately for you, that's, that's one thing that you don't have to worry about. It's like, you know, the drinking and driving or, or getting into arguments or, or what have you because of that. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's true. I do, uh, a lot of, uh, Coke and heroin. So that's another issue, well, but, I mean, uh, you, you got to balance these things out though. You know, you, <laughs> yeah. you can't, you can't just be right? all opiate all the time. You gotta, you gotta mix in some alcohol in there and, and kind of level it so out. So that's you know? what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm trying to, to lead a, a more balanced life and yeah. that's part of it. I yeah. think it's all yeah. about balance, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, something we find very balancing around here are these. Uh, Patrick, you had mentioned one, and I, I don't even have it on my notes right now, but you had mentioned a TED Talk that you found really, really good, and me and Kent hadn't even heard of it. So can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is Hans Rosling, who is a statistician, an economist, and he's done a couple of TED Talks. The, the one I'm talking about is a little bit old now. It's from 2006, but it is, it is enlightening. It, it's amazing. Basically, what he does is uh, try to paint a picture of the state of the world through statistics uh, uh, that are animated. And uh, so basically it's very entertaining as most TED Talks are, but he's sort of showing how much our perception of the world differs from actual reality, factual reality. And, um, and, and I'm saying it's enlightening because it shows you how much of your assumptions are wrong. Um, and I think especially you know, it was from 10 years ago, but I think it's still the case today. We have, uh, because of a lot of factors, including the way media works, which where it's a lot more uh, profitable to show something that is dramatic and negative than it is to show something positive, we have a sort of skewed vision of reality. And um, and I think it's important to we were talking about balance a little bit earlier in a different context, um, but in in especially in our perception of the world, I think it's important to to understand the bad things that are happening and that we certainly have an abundance of, but also the good things and the good ways the world is evolving. So there are a lot of things that he's showing um, that, you know, are about uh, poverty, uh, literacy rate, uh, you know, these kinds of things in places that we don't really know, um, like, you know, just the, the, the entire world, but uh, Southeastern Asia, Africa, all of those places. And it's sort of an excellent way of not necessarily learning everything you need to know about these topics. Obviously, it's way too short for that. But to at least get people to take a step back and think, oh, okay, maybe things aren't exactly the way I thought they were. Um, and that's always incredibly important. So... Really enjoyed it. Uh, Kent, does that sound more or less interesting than uh, than Eric Liu? Because I think that sounds pretty awesome. No, that that's incredibly interesting to me because people today tend to be cynical and really focus on the negative. Um, you know, part of that I suppose is is media's fault, but it's there's something going on in our in our like collective psyche, I guess, in society where we tend to dwell on the negative things. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to realize that, you know, not everything is bad. And in fact, the, a lot of people say that like, Oh, the world today is just so terrible. Well, honestly, the, the world right now is the best that it's ever been. If you look at the numbers and the statistics and, you know, uh, we're not as hungry, like as a, as a human race, we're not as hungry um, we're not as, um, uh, I guess, susceptible to violence. Uh, it seems like we're, you know, we're just in all kinds of wars all over the place. But uh, looking at world history, like this is a pretty safe world right now compared to any other time in history. And it's just sometimes we just got to stop and look at, you know, what's really going on and not be so cynical and negative, you know, and it's, it's good to see things like this. 
Yeah, I'm not even going to try to try to match what you said there because I'm the cynical asshole of this group. So uh, that's that's all me. Well, I'm, you know, I I really think if you watch this TED talk, um, you'll be a little bit less cynical. It's exactly what this is good for. It uh, sort of paints a picture of the world again as it is, and it's kind of difficult. He's so entertaining as well and good spirited. It's kind of difficult to remain. I'm sure you'll still be cynical to an extent, but it's difficult to remain completely cynical once you've seen this because it's absolutely true. Everything is going the right way. Um, and as difficult as it is to uh, to notice when we're stuck in everyday crap, uh, on on the world level, everything is going the right way. So sorry, I interrupted you and your cynicism. So get <laughs> no, back to no. it. By, by by all means, that's that's mostly what I need because I'm, like I said, I, I'm the cynic here. Um, now, Kent, I alluded to it earlier, but uh, Eric Liu, there's no such thing as not voting. Um, I will hold my comments because I'm very interested to hear yours. Yeah. So th- this was a. This was an interesting talk. Uh, it's relevant to what's been going on in the United States. Uh, it's about voting, as the title suggests. Uh, this guy has a, a, a little bit of a different view, a, a non-cynical view on voting. Uh, a lot of people get really discouraged and think, you know, why bother voting? Uh, what's the point? Uh, but this guy, he talks about how in the history of the United States, he's, he's mostly talking about the United States uh, in, in the uh, voting context and how in the vast majority of our 200, what are we at now? Winter, almost like, 200. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to public math right now. Yeah, math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in most of our, our history as a country, people have been enthusiastic about voting and just excited for it. People have fought and died for the right to vote, uh, not only at the the onset of our country, uh, but also uh, you know abolition of slavery, uh, women's suffrage. Uh, you know, pe- people have have literally died for the right to vote, and throughout our history, people have been very very excited, jubilant, and uh, it, it, it was celebrated. Yes celebratory that that pretty much sums it up celebratory about voting but in the last couple of decades we've really grown cynical as a nation about the entire democratic process and uh, i think part of that is is uh feeling let down or left behind by the system uh and we don't feel like it it matters to vote because no matter how i vote it's still going to turn out some shitty way so why bother and this guy he kind of takes the opposite view of that. We need to bring back some of that excitement, some of that uh, energy into the very idea of not just voting, but but the democratic process as a whole. Uh, and he was talking about some projects that his his team has has started around the country to to, to get more people involved, uh, creative people. Uh, they're talking about music and like different plays and things right. that they that they're doing to. Uh, you know, different artistic projects, whatever, to get people excited about voting. Uh, and I think that would probably be a good thing if we as a country gave more of a shit, I guess, about voting and about the process itself. Um, I don't know. You watched the same talk, Amos. What, how, what did you take from this? So do, do you know the problems, the, the problem with self-help books and management books? Because they both have the same problem. Right. There's, I think you touched on this before where there's there's so many of them out there and the vast majority of those books don't have anything for you. But it's that little nugget. Right. But here's 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 the point is they have that one little nugget and they usually shoot that wad off like <laughs> right first couple of chapters. You don't have to read the rest. It's just more elaboration on that basic point. Right. right. This talk is the same thing. The important part was that they're doing projects to encourage people to vote and to celebrate voting. And that was covered in the first four minutes. The entire rest of it was just rehashing and junk. And I didn't get anything out of the last half of it at all. 
Um, if, if this had been a five or six minute talk, it would have been one of my favorites. It's like 18 minutes and the, the last 13 minutes of it, I, I didn't get anything out of it. It was just time killing. And like, I'm trying to prep for a show, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you know, I, I kind of had a similar thought, uh, because I, I was probably five or six minutes into the talk and I'm like, wow, this guy has really covered this topic. Well, and I, I clicked the, the screen so I could see how much was left. And I was only halfway through the talk. I was like, Oh man, where's he going to go with this? It was and, basically just, and I nowhere. watched the same thing over again. Yeah, he, he went nowhere. So, but he, but he was an engaging speaker, I thought, and he's he w- he was enjoyable to listen to. But I I did have kind of the same feeling, like okay. he was just kind of going over and over. Uh, um. So so there's that. Uh, Patrick, what initially brought you to TED Talks, if you don't mind me asking? Um, can't remember honestly. I think it's like everyone else. Uh, people started sharing them, and uh, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I you know it's the quintessential quality of the internet that you're going to discover sometimes the worst, but hopefully even more often the best of what human knowledge has to offer. And um, TED Talks are definitely one of the examples of when you come across it, I think unless you're, I don't know who you have to be to not think this is amazing. I, I, it's very difficult for anyone in the world to watch a good TED talk and think, "Meh," you know, uh, a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, there's, there's, I don't know. Do you guys know the channel um, Crash Course on YouTube? Mm. Uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken, I don't think Ken's, Ken's, I don't Ken's, Ken's not, uh, Ken's not fully initiated into Nerdfighteria. Okay, well, uh, please go check it out. Basically, uh, it's another example of that, what the best internet has to offer. Uh, You know, the best internet has to offer quality of things. Um, It's a couple of uh, academic brothers who decided to do a, a series of courses but in the in the style of YouTube, so it's very short. It's uh, you know they cover different topics. There's world history, there's uh, uh, economics, there's lots of things, and they've been growing a lot. So they have a lot of different topics now. But um, they take ten or twenty or thirty episodes, which are ten minutes in length, and each one of them is going to cover obviously a specific topic. But it goes into uh it, it, the style is that of youtube you know very quick cuts uh very funny v- lots of jokes lots of memes but it very serious and academically sound at the same time so each course is as i was saying 10 to 40 episodes uh there's one of on astronom- astronomy that was wonderful and um so yeah i think that was the same reaction i had when with with ted it's just you guys are probably around the same age as I am. And so we knew a time where if you didn't know something, you didn't know it. And that was it, right? You, you, it, yeah. Either you were kind of rich and you had a an encyclopedia in your home, you know, a, a large or a li- uh, 10 volume yeah. or, or a library next to you. But if you were at dinner and you were talking about something... Um, and you didn't know, no one had a magical, you know, knowledge device to pull out and figure out how old, uh, George Clooney really is. <laughs> right. Um, so <laughs> I think Ted was one of the first times along with Wikipedia, Wikipedia and these kinds of things where I was amazed by the power that technology can have on everyday life. And so, yeah, a very long winded answer to say, because it's amazing. <laughs> right, right. No, that was, that was, that was a good answer. I I got one quick follow-up question for you about the Ted talk that we watched. How is voting viewed in your country? Are people excited about it or is it like a civic duty that people aren't necessarily, uh, you know, amped up to go do? Um, it depends on the election. 
but definitely for the presidential election, if we get 80% participation, then it's very low. Um, it's oh. usually well above that for the presidential election. People are very engaged. Um, and there are more and more people, I think, as it is the case around the world, saying, well, fuck you, you can tell me what to do. You know, it's like, I don't want to vote and whatever. But every time this happens, or most of the time this happens, um, the elections show, without getting into details, because I know you guys can't really talk about it too much, but in the U.S., it, it's basically what the title of that talk was. It's There's no such thing as not voting. Even if you don't vote, uh, the margins in this election uh, were so thin that not voting meant you did vote. I guess it can be, you know, you throw your hands in the air and you're like, either of those clowns are fine or, you know, either of those clowns are, are not fine and um, and you're happy with the result either way or unhappy with the result either way. But, in yeah, in France, people usually uh, get out and vote. And personally, I think it's a, it's an important part of our democracy. And if I have to find a reason why uh, people are less likely to vote today than they were before. Um, I think the the quality of the candidates probably has something to do with it. But also, I'm wondering if it is, doesn't have to do with the complacency that we're getting into with our democracies because we're taking them for granted, right? Uh, after, the, after the last big war we had... Um, you know, I'm talking about World War II. Mm -hmm. it, it, people were very f felt very fortunate to be able to cho to influence their own destiny, and I think now, ironically, things are so good. You know, we all have a, especially in Europe, I think we all have a roof, we all have free healthcare, we all have. It's easy to get into uh, a, a mood of, well, this isn't isn't going to change it all that much and it's true but it i don't it, i think personally it doesn't mean it's not precious and just for the for the privilege of being able to vote and to influence your destiny we should still do it but yeah i i understand some people disagree but yeah yeah no th those are those are good words i appreciate I, hearing that actually I, I i will tell you flat out that this this i, di I didn't vote I haven't voted since the first time I voted uh, G Dub in, and I've no, have, still haven't felt good about myself since. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still living with regret on that one. So I just haven't voted. Uh, but you know what? There's some more pleasant things to talk about than uh, the American election, and that would be last weekend. We mentioned it earlier, but Patrick, you went to BlizzCon, man. How is how was BlizzCon? Um, BlizzCon was, as always, incredibly tiring and incredibly awesome it's a uh, it's a very special convention for those i mean i'm sure most of the people in the audience know about it but it's a, a convention centered around the games from one specific developer which is blizzard entertainment um and it's it's a very you know there are lots of different kinds of cons there are um there are conventions that are it's always fa fan centered but even things like uh video game conventions like gamescom or e3 or tokyo game show things like that are very wide ranging and i'm sure comic con um is somewhat similar even pax i've been to not pax prime but i've been to uh pax east um there are lots of different uh topics and and games and things to rally around at BlizzCon, it's four to five games, and everyone you're going to meet is going to be geeking out about that specific thing you love. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredible feeling. You know, it's uh, whatever you are passionate about, you know, in, in the audience, whatever you really like, whatever is your thing, which is maybe not shared by your family or your co-workers or imagine if there was a place a magical place 
<laughs> where everyone you that was around you enjoyed and loved that thing. That is BlizzCon. Mm. It's it's basically going to a game, uh, I mean a sports game, a sports event, or a concert where everyone is is on the same wavelength. Mm. Um, and it's rare for video games specifically. Uh, it's getting more and more common, but it's it's still not very common. So um, it's very special. Uh, so th- there's a lot of video game developers out there, uh, more than we could name on this show. Uh, but there's something special about Blizzard. Uh, we're, we're talking about like Warcraft, Starcraft, World of Warcraft. Um, Diablo. Uh, Don't forget Diablo. Don't you dare forget yes, Diablo. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> uh, you know, all of, all of these games, Overwatch now, um, Hearthstone. Hearthstone. Yep. All of these amazing games. What makes Blizzard so special that people are just absolutely passionate about everything that that company makes what how are they different now in, in full disclosure patrick at once upon a time was uh, tightly associated with blizzard yeah that's that's what i was gonna say if you start <laughs> talking about the company itself i did work for them for five years um uh left them two years ago to start podcasting full time so yeah absolutely full disclosure um but i think you know it's Everyone will have their own opinion. Um, I think the way I look at it is that Blizzard is one of those few companies that has a very deep-seated love for the product they design. Um, I think in every company there is always a tug of war of, or you know, some balance that has to be found between the product people and the sales people. It's basically the, the, the battle, the constant battle between uh, the people who are developing the thing you want to sell and the marketing. And I think in many companies, if not most companies, um, the marketing people have final say. And in very concrete terms, you know, it's, it's things like setting the agenda for you know the schedule for releases they're going to say all right we need a strong product at the end of q2 and we need a release at the end of q3 and we need to hit the holiday season for this or that and i'm you know i'm talking about games i'm talking about hardware i'm talking about every everything you can think of just in any Um, product cycle yeah yeah and and just design letting very concretely letting the uh, marketing aspects of your company, which are very important. I don't want to dismiss them completely. They are very important. But letting the marketing aspects of your of your strategy and your company influence your product a little bit too much, maybe. Um, and at Blizzard, it doesn't work like that. Uh, again, from a very concrete point of view, and I can confirm that firsthand because I used to work there, um, the people who have the power within the company, the the decision power, are the developers. Um, Now, of course, that means that they need to be aware and capable in terms of of marketing and communication and all of this. They can't just ignore that and go off and and be, you know, divas that that will never ship anything because that doesn't make for a successful company. Um, And also it means that sometimes it's, very difficult uh, for the people responsible for those other areas like uh, PR and marketing to uh, uh, adapt to the changes that maybe they hadn't planned for. But ultimately, it means that the primary, uh, uh, the priority is in the the product itself and the quality when you have really talented people that are given the opportunity to work like this and who do have, uh, you know, the, the clarity to understand when you need to actually ship, the, the result is a, a high quality product. Um, I think we've seen this in other companies. There are some game developer companies like Rockstar and uh, Valve when they weren't so busy with their Steam store uh, that they had time to develop games and 
that, that that do things like this as well. There are hardware companies like, you know, off the top of my head, I think Apple uh, has done that more than once. Um, and and that is a good way of creating brand loyalty and loyalty among your customers. When you, there's one example with Diablo, um, Diablo 3 that came out in 2002 and that wasn't up to the standards of the company and the the players and the company didn't put their hands up in the air and think okay well whatever we missed the mark on that one they went back in and fixed it and i think that's how you develop that loyalty that's how you show that you really care about what you're doing um you care about making money of course but what blizzard has figured out is that the best way to make the most money possible is to make great games um and so they they try really hard to do that now, yeah and that that seems like it would be a a, a common sense no-brainer sort of thing. i know right <laughs> it's it seems to be rare in this industry this is in today's day and age game companies seem to release beta products and on day one you have to download a patch just to play the game well, so that specifically, if the game is very competent once you have the patch, I think it's fine. The thing is, you know, you used to have um, the the. There is a point at which you need to actually press the CDs and put them out in the stores. And the the thing is, today you keep development going after that point has passed, so you do have a. Uh, a patch ready to go when the actual release date uh, comes around and uh, you know it's been you stopped development quote unquote three weeks before because you had to manufacture the things so now you can what happened before was that the games were so much less complex that it was possible to fix everything and just decide okay i'm gonna ship uh, but if if there were bugs then the bugs were there, and that was it. You couldn't fix them. Now you can. So I think if the, the patch on release day fixes everything, it's okay. The problem arises when you have a patch on, on launch day and still you have big problems, and that's a little bit too common, I, I would agree. Um, as far as day one patches, and I think this is one of those common complaints that a lot of people really gripe about, like, oh, it's got to... In my opinion, and this is just me... <clears throat> When you are selling a standalone product that is not internet connected, then the the day you know or or that can can be not connected. Let's just say that like once you install Diablo on, on your PlayStation, you don't have to be connected to play. Like it'll it'll let you play. Um, it's it's not it's not the best experience, but you can technically play. Um, but when a game is required, like World of Warcraft things like that, you have to be online and. And technically, I mean, World of Warcraft, you can preload Steam games. You can preload the files, stuff like that. When there's a day one patch, I don't mind that so much. It's on the standalone or standalone able products that you can play without being connected to the Internet. And now it needs a patch. So now I've got to go out of my way to connect something I may not normally connect. That's when it pisses me off. Um, and I think Blizzard, maybe it's because most of their products are digital releases and stuff like that. I think Blizzard has actually been really good about that, and maybe that's something they learned early from EverQuest, because I remember EverQuest, the day one patch would be bigger than the initial install for, <laughs> you know, for the uh, expansion. Like, holy crap, when uh, when Moons of, uh, oh, shit, uh, Moons of, when Lucelin came out in, uh, in EverQuest, that day one patch was insane, especially on a 56K connection. It was ridiculous. Oh. Like, you installed it, and then you sat there and you waited another day and a half in, in Japan <laughs> on dial-up to download the damn patch. And it was ridiculous. And I think companies like Blizzard really understand that. And, and you know, maybe they just don't release the final files that they're not quite sure are, are release ready until right before release. But either way, I, I don't have a problem with it on digital releases. And I think Blizzard's been really good about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, every Blizzard game is connected now, and you preload everything. So yeah, there aren't day one patches, but there are, you know, day one minus three days patches. So I don't know. I understand it's not the same thing, but I think I understand where you're coming from. But also, 
at the same time today, it's the internet is kind of a given. And for someone who has a limited connection or I could go on a rant about the in infrastructure in the U.S. and the data caps, which are, I think, outrageous. But uh, in yeah. in today's world, it's kind of I, my feeling is it's kind of okay to assume that people have a decent internet connection in general. And the reality is they're assuming that now. So you do have multiple gigs patches on most games on launch day. And if you're on an ADSL connection, that's, you know, hopefully it's fast enough that it's going to be a couple of hours of download. Um, but you at least have that, right? No one doesn't have at least that nowadays. It's uh, not pretty, yeah, pretty much. Not, I would not say if you're in, in tech circles or not if you can have, if you have the capability and the means, uh, maybe in, in rural, like Oxford, Indiana probably doesn't have cable, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, cable. yeah, okay, maybe not cable, but ADSL, decent ADSL. Yeah, yeah they, they've they got a, a pretty decent ADSL. These and, and we're talking about day one patches. I just want to say Civilization VI had a day two patch, if that matters at all, or maybe it was day three. The game is 4.8 uh, gigabytes for the install. The day three patch or whatever it was, was 1.2 gigabytes. So... <laughs> That's like that's that's kind of ridiculous. Although I didn't notice because I didn't play for like two days and then it just automatically downloaded because of Steam. But still, you know that's the, that twenty five percent of the install. That, that's still that's kind of that's EverQuest level, you know. Right, <laughs> but it's it's so fast these days that most patches, you know, you'll get them. Right. Sometimes without even realizing that you're downloading a patch. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, we uh, we forgot a very important thing, Kent. Uh, yeah, what would that be? We forgot geekandgamergear.com. Oh, I didn't forget. Oh, I, 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 I blew right past it. Like <laughs> I've been shopping there, dude, because I can't forget geekandgamergear.com because that's where I get all of my really geeky toys and, and like my hats and stuff. I, I got to get them somewhere because I don't have a nerd store in my town anymore. So geekandgamergear.com is where I go. And I have a nerd store, but I can't find the stuff that I'm looking for, man. Like that's, I mean, it's just, that's the way it is. Especially, especially at the low prices that you can get things at, at geek, geekandgamergear.com. But you know, what's really awesome. If you go to geekandgamergear.com and find some really cool stuff, throw it in your shopping cart. If you use ritual misery at checkout, you get an additional ten percent off your entire order. Now, my local my local store can't match that. Uh, definitely not. That's... Try try walking into a, a, a Hastings or a, a I don't know. I don't even know the name of your of your geek score geek store. But I don't. Try I don't even. There. I don't either because it doesn't have a cool name like geekandgamergear.com. Like that. True. That's that's what you need when you're when you're selling geek and gamer gear. Try walking in there and asking for a discount code, Ritual Misery, and right. just see the looks you get. I should, I should totally try that. I'm, I'm going to try that next time I'm over there. I'm going to say, hey, uh, I got a discount code, Ritual Misery. Um, I'm going to use that at checkout, and you're going to give me, uh, gonna give me 10 percent off. Is that cool? And I'm going to, I'm going to see what they say. Yes, do that. Report back on that next week. So, so if, if, if I actually want success on that, where am I going to go? geekandgamergear.com that's geek the letter n gamergear.com and use ritual misery at checkout for an additional 10% off that's amazing that's amazing um so tomorrow well today for patrick and hell today for us now uh yeah today <laughs> today is veterans day here in the u.s um it's a day, of course, me and Kent find it very uh, well, important because it's a day off, usually. And right. Because huh. it, it celebrates us. Like, that's just weird. You know, it's kind of it, it's kind of weird. Um, we, we don't think of it that way, but, I mean, this, the civilian populace typically will. And you know, what's, you know what's weird to me? When I put this in the notes, I was actually thinking, when I was writing this, I was like, this is an opportunity for me to tell Amos, who is still active duty military, you know, thank you for your service. It didn't even occur to me that at, at that moment, it didn't occur to me that I, that I was part of this. Right. It's, um, it's, 
it's weird because like in our community, we don't think really about ourselves. Right. You know, that this day is for us. I always think about, you know, you or people that are, are actively serving right now. And it's, uh, uh, it's weird because I don't, I'm not a self congratulatory type of person at all. Uh, but I do, I do think that service, well, service of any type, uh, but in this case, we're talking about military service. I think it's important and it's important to, for people to, to recognize the sacrifices that are, that are made by service members. And, um, and that's not for, like I said, it's not a self congratulatory thing, but I think it's important for, for people to recognize members of their own community or their own family, uh, I don't know. That's that's why I put it in there. I just think I think it's important for not just to have a day off or an excuse to have a, a cookout. Those things are great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but also, you know, take a moment, you know, thank your grandpa, or your uncle or your cousin or whoever. Uh, Patrick, do you have something like that there uh, in France or in, in Finland where you celebrate uh, previous previous members of the military and uh, their 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 efforts? Um, so we have, uh, remembrance days for, uh, end of wars. Today is the end of the first world war, for example, the armistice. Mm -hmm. And that is what we celebrate today. Um, I think there is, and I can't really speak for Finland because I don't know it well enough, but for France, there is a kind of a, uh, defiance towards uh, patriotism, which is a little bit unsettling to me. It's, um, I think it's, it stems from World War II, where basically we had a form of nationalism that took over Europe and that uh, took over parts of, of France as well. And, you know, once, you know, with the, uh, the Vichy government, which was basically France was split in two and there was a lot of nationalism, which makes us very wary of people who try to glorify uh, the country a little bit too much. And certainly when I look at the U.S., uh, it's it's it does make me instinctively a little bit uneasy when people start chanting USA, USA for every, you know, every other, uh, any reason it started. It's, it's funny when it's jokey, but it feels a little bit extreme when it's like, because it, inherently when you, when you start chanting USA, USA, we're the best country in the world. What you're also saying, which I understand is not part of the conscious, uh, uh, feeling is the other guys suck, right? We're better than you want than you guys. And right. I, it's, it's, it's sort of the dark side of patriotism, but I think in France, we only see that dark side and it leads to a little bit of, we, we never see the, uh, the positive side of it, which is the elation, the togetherness, the celebration of who we are, um, which is I think a little bit of a problem. I think there's there's a, a balance to be found, and certainly in France, I think we're a little bit too far to the self-deprecation. And when you when you see a flag, for example, put out somewhere, it's it's suspect immediately. You think, ooh, why is that person waving a flag? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's a sports event, then yes, it's very accepted. But when you have someone uh, showing a flag on their window, for example, you're thinking, hmm, is that person a, uh, you know, far right movement person? Uh, that's exact. that's immediately where your mind goes to. And it shouldn't be. I, I I deeply believe that patriotism should be, uh, you know, it can be a positive thing. And, and I think in most cases in the U.S. it is and in many other countries it is. So we have that stigma um, of I think it's because of the stigma of the world wars. And it would be nice to um, to to be able to to get out of it to an extent. Yeah. So. And that's something that that I, <laughs> I, I used to live in Europe. I lived in Germany for five years. Uh, I moved there in 2008. It was part of my military service. Uh, moved there in 2008, and it was in the middle of—I um, don't think it was the World Cup. I think it was uh, maybe it was the 
European Championship or something. Uh, 2008, I think, might have been World Cup. Was it World Cup? Okay, well, so I'm not sure. So Germany was, I don't remember if they won that year, but they were definitely in contention. And when we arrived in the country, there were German flags absolutely everywhere. And to me, as an American, that just seems natural. You hang your country's flag, right? Yeah. But everyone was just like, I can't believe all these flags. Like, they're just flags everywhere. This is unheard of here. <laughs> what? So they had to explain to me, like, kind of kind of what you were talking about, but maybe didn't go into as much detail. Uh, but they were just saying that, you know, flags, you know, here in Europe, you don't display flags, really. This is a, This is kind of an odd thing to have this, like, this national pride and i i was like oh, that's yeah. complete opposite of the united states <laughs> yeah it's um it's come back a little bit with of all things uh terrorism uh as sad as it is obviously when we've been um when we've had attacks especially in france you see people putting out flags again and at that point there is this uh Again, this feeling of togetherness and of of pride, you know, of saying we are our nation and we're proud proud of it. Um, but very often I get comments. I you know I I enjoy my national pride, and sometimes I get comments of people saying like, "Well, I don't think of myself as French. I think of myself as a citizen of the world." And I'm like, <sighs> okay, <laughs> um, it's like. Right. No, I'm also a citizen of the world and I love everyone, but it's okay to be French or to be, but yeah, again, there are, there are reasons for it and there are, you know, people are wary of, of these kinds of things. So yeah. I wish basically just to, to finish off, uh, I wish that we could take back the symbols of national pride from the those far right movements because right now they're the only ones displaying them and showing them and i think that's not right i think it's unfair i think we should use them to show that it's not theirs they shouldn't be able to overtake them and make them into something that's uh a little bit dirty and and not respectable so that's my view on it and if people would like to hear more of your views on worldly things, video games, and other such happenings, where can they go to find out? Uh, I would suggest you go to frenchspin.com. I have a couple of shows there. One is about video games. It's called Pixels. And we cover we, the idea is that we cover the industry news, the important things, every couple of weeks in an hour and a half. And so you don't have to go and, and check out every single uh, gaming blog out there. Uh, the other one is called The Phileas Club. And it's a show where we get together people from different countries, different cultures, different origins. And we discuss uh news from you know the past month or so and w really with the idea of listening to what people have to say and of course we have you know banter and good humor uh, conversations but also try to listen to people and not necessarily try to convince them of our own points of view and uh because i think there are it, there's a lot of that in uh, every type of media and every spectrum, uh, you know, every part of the political spectrum, if you want to find someone that's going to try to convince you of something, then, you know, you'll be well served. But it, there isn't so much, uh, so many places to listen to what people have to say. And that's, you know, to an extent what we try to do there. So if you think that you might enjoy it, go to frenchspin.com and you'll find that uh, there. Now, yeah, what what is available all over iTunes and everywhere else? Now, now, what if what if they've uh, they've taken about four or five years of French and uh, they'd like to brush up on that and <laughs> um, maybe maybe they just want to try to experience the French language uh, from a, from a native native speaker? Well, go to Frenchspin.fr. You'll find uh, shows on gaming and tech there in the same spirit as the one I was talking about uh, for gaming in English. That's uh, So Frenchspin.com, Frenchspin.fr, it's very easy. See, and that's what I like about you. You just keep it right there. It's like you can't mess it up. Uh, and, of course, you are <laughs> not Patrick on uh, on Twitter. Um, can Absolutely. You, can, can you summarize and, like, uh, real quickly why you're not Patrick? Patrick was taken. <laughs>
<laughs> again, again, Sim simple. <laughs> yeah, no, and and honestly, the thing is, people often wonder why I'm not Patrick, and the thing. So the real reason is Patrick was taken, but also, it's it from a marketing standpoint, it's perfect from a brand building standpoint. You will never forget that I'm not Patrick. Right. It's forever ingrained in your in your brain now. So that also plays into it. Well nice. played. Well played. Uh, Kent, what do you got for us, man? Well, see, I was really late to the Twitter game, so I've got underscores and extra letters and crap in my name. Uh, so I am at RM underscore Del Noche on Twitter. Follow me there for, you know, whatever weird things that I'm putting up there. Uh, it seems like the mood of my Twitter changes week to week. So go there find out what i'm doing if you're a beer guy like me you can go to ratebeer.com look up username del noche and you can read my over 500 beer reviews um i was not late to the twitter game but just late enough to miss the anthony mark uh and the amos mark and the anthony lemos mark and man i i missed all the marks even though i was fairly early to the game so I use my pseudonym from high school when I was writing poetry all the time. I'm at Ethan Kane on Twitter, and that's the only social media that I use because that's the only one I care about. And, you can, of course, you can find the show at Ritual Misery. You can cruise on over to ritualmisery.com slash swag. I got to tell you, this is probably the last week to get our still in beta shirts. We are no longer in beta. Those are limited quantity limited time offers they're going away as soon as i can figure out how to get cafe press to work uh they are going away and uh, very limited and of course if you are wearing one of our still in beta shirts or any of our first edition shirts or any of the other first edition swag and we see you in the wild at a festival at south by southwest which we are confirmed for or nerdtacular which we are confirmed for any of those we will buy you a drink period dot end of story Yep. It's at, least, at least two drinks because we we never travel too far away from each other, so yeah, and that'll pay that'll pay for the shirt. Yeah. So buy the shirt, <laughs> show up where we're at, you get the free drinks, basically equivalent to the price of the shirt. It's and a free shirt. It's a, it's a free shirt. It's a, it's you get two drinks and a free shirt. It's it, like everybody wins. Um, <laughs> and of course. Uh, we got. We have to thank uh, Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use this music right here. So awesome over in Comtech.com or com, yeah, it's in com, man. I always mess that up. Like I, I put the P. I put the P <laughs> in the wrong place. Hey, um, Kent, it is so good to be back in the post-election spin-up world where we can all just start hating rich white guys again. <laughs> I don't know about. <laughs> Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much for coming on our show. You have been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. I, I hope it was okay. I I feel like, first of all, I wasn't feeling super energetic, but then I feel like I spoke way too much as I usually do. So I hope I hope it was good. We, no, it was, we, it was uh, great. You contributed greatly to the uh, loose notes that Amos and I through together yeah. last minute um <laughs> and and you, you brought the overall intelligence level of this podcast to like an all-time high so what? uh <laughs> oh, yeah, you're that. too kind <laughs> i um, do want to also mention that next week our guest will be curtis larock from chat uh yes and uh i'm not sure if he's bringing company or not so we'll just, ah we'll, yes we'll, maybe curtis curtis plus one right 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 well, so that and, but that will be a normally, I believe, a normal time schedule show, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it should be Wednesday night, uh, 9 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. So, uh, meanwhile, uh, we are currently streaming on YouTube because I forgot to change my settings from when I was doing the backup stream for the election night coverage. So, it didn't even go out to Diamond Club, uh, which, oh, which oh yeah, no. sucks on that me. That would explain some of the, uh, the, some of the chat, chat room. Bit. Yeah. 